to the 10th annual Global Health Conference. Uh, the theme for this year's conference is Striving for Health Equity. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited for the, uh, the lineup of our sessions for today. I wanna to begin with our land acknowledgement. Ottawa is built on an unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. The peoples of the Algonquin Anishinaabe nation have lived on this territory for millennia and we honor them and this land. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. GEO also honors all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and their valuable past, present and future contributions to this land. Through the unwavering commitment of Dr. Heather McDonnell, the Global Health Conference began as a grassroots passion project at CHEO to improve children's health worldwide through education, awareness, and inspiration. And I believe she has really achieved in that goal. Her goal has been to inspire learners, clinicians, and researchers to help marginalize children and youth in Canada and abroad. And this has really resonated with so many of us given the high uh, participation and engagement in global health that we've seen over this short period of time. Over this time, we've witnessed many global health issues, both abroad and within our own country. And previous global health conferences have highlighted these issues. The COVID pandemic has taught us many things, and one in particular is about the significant inequities in healthcare that exist between countries and even within our own borders. Hence the theme of, for this year, striving for health equity. The opportunity to shift to a virtual platform has enabled a really great array of guest speakers and we're fortunate to have a truly international lineup for today's conference. Dr. McDonnell will do a formal introduction of each of the presenters uh, throughout the morning. Um, and I wanted to thank our presenters at this point, um, thank our presenters for today. And in particular, our keynote speaker who will present Grand Rounds this morning. And while we are just beginning our day, he is at the end of what has likely been a very long day. I think it's 11.30 p.m. in Australia. Uh, so thank you again for, uh, for being here to uh, share your wisdom and share your inspiration for us. Uh, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Before we uh, do our formal um, uh, introduction for our guest speaker, I'd like to hand it over to our president and CEO, Mr. Alex Munter. Over to you, Alex. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mona. And I'll be brief. I, I want Dr. Ogle to be able to get to bed at some point. So, um, um, so, so great, great, uh, great to see you all. Great, especially to see, to see Heather. Um, you know, Heather and, and Mona alluded to it. You know, Heather really has been uh, the champion of this initiative, uh, the conference, the focus, uh, sticking with it. Uh, so happy. For, for 10 years. So first of all, happy anniversary uh, to, uh, to Heather. Uh, thank you for uh, your uh, leadership, you know, and, and when Mona says, you know, the, the, the purpose of this conference is education, awareness, and inspiration. Um, you know, those are things that we could print on Heather's business cards if in fact we still had business cards. Um, <clears throat> So, so thank you, Heather. Thank you, everyone who's participated in 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 uh, organizing the conference. You know, I, I do think the pandemic um, really has presented a paradox uh, in that uh, the the borders closing, hostility to the other, uh, focus on uh, an insular focus by rich countries on ourselves uh, and our own safety has had consequences around the world. At the same time, uh, what a teachable moment this is for the world uh, uh, on global health, how we are all uh, interconnected and how a threat to health anywhere is a threat to health everywhere. Uh, and hopefully uh, as we, uh, move from uh, in many countries and hopefully soon in all countries from pandemic to endemic status for COVID that we can apply these learnings. Uh, and we really will need to for kids because on a global scale, uh, the impact learning losses, impact on development, impact on physical mental health, impact on vaccination rates um, has been devastating. And this has been a huge setback for children's well-being here in Canada, but around the world. And we will, as a, as a global community of people who care about children's health, 
really need to work together uh, to uh, address those gaps uh, and to, uh, to catch up, um, uh, to, to regain uh, the, 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 the gains that were lost over the last couple of years. And initiatives like this conference and, and the leadership you are all showing by being here and engaging in these issues is a crucial part of that. So thank you. Bienvenue à tous et à toutes. Merci de, de participer. Uh, and I wish you a really great conference today. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mona and Alex, for those kind words. It is a milestone, and I really think that uh, this year's keynote speaker, which I have the pleasure of introducing, uh, really tops off the uh, the international flavor of it. But also, as we'll discuss, you know, it's a year of anniversaries, and it's the hundredth year anniversary of the discovery of insulin as well by doctors Banting, Best, and McLeod. So tying these two things together global health advocacy, you know, and inviting a pediatric endocrinologist from the other side of the world uh, really is unique. It's my pleasure um, to formally introduce Dr. Graham Ogle, who is a pediatric endocrinologist based in Sydney, Australia. He works for Diabetes New South Wales as general manager for the Life for a Child program and is an adjunct professor at the University of Sydney. There at the University of Sydney, he also graduated from medical school and trained in pediatric endocrinology, doing research in growth and body composition. In the 1990s, he lived in Papua New Guinea and Cambodia, uh, with the chair, working with the charity Hope Worldwide. From 2000 to 2012, he continued to oversee various health and educational programs in Papua New Guinea. Life for a Child commenced in 2000. This program based at Diabetes New South Wales in Sydney is amazing and it supports the care of 22,000 children and youth with diabetes in 43 countries. Support is provided directly to existing diabetic services, but its aim is really to provide the best possible care given each local circumstance to all children and youth with diabetes with the aspirational vision that no child should die of diabetes. For this work, Graham has been lauded with several awards, including the Harold Rifkin Award for Distinguished International Service in the Cause of Diabetes by the American Diabetes Association in 2013, and the Listrade Award for Advocacy from the International Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Diabetes in 2019. His broad research interests include diabetes epidemiology, access to care, and other issues that we will hear from him now related to diabetes in less resourced countries. So a big Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, and Chio welcome to Dr. Ogle. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, can you see the slides there? Yes, okay. I'd like to thank Dr. McDonnell and, and Dr. Jabul for this, inv uh, this invitation to speak to you. And uh, I've never been to Ottawa, uh, and I, but I have had contact, as you'll hear, with, 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 with some of your doctors, and, and I would love to come one day. Uh, and um, if you want to know what the weather will be this afternoon, it'll be in the mid-20s Celsius and, and sunny, slightly windy, and um, enjoy it, because that's what it was in Sydney. So I'm not sure what it'll be in your way, but we had a nice day here. So uh, this picture is, uh, I'll be showing a few artworks and, and also quotes from young people that we support. We've run a couple of art and story competitions over the years, and this is from the most recent competition uh, one of the prize winners uh, from uh, done by a young fellow in Bolivia with diabetes, which, which shows the type rope that these children walk uh, all the time. Now, I was asked to talk about the spark that got me into this, and, and I, I must talk about, I must mention my father, who served in the, the Australian Army in 1943 to 1945 in Papua New Guinea. And dad almost never, I can only rem remember him speaking about the war once. Uh, in my life, but he always had respect for the people of Papua New Guinea. And when I went up there as a medical student in 1983, uh, at the end of my uh, medical course to do an elective up there, 
um, he was very supportive and, and helped uh, with, with, with some of the funds. And this is a picture of me in the Highlands uh, with a sort of a, a hat that they gave me made of, made of uh, grass, because otherwise I would have got very sunburnt because there was an unexpected big walk that day. And then 10 years later, my wife and I and our nine month old child, Penny, uh, went to Papua New Guinea to work with the, 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 the Christian mission, um, uh, Church of Christ mission, uh, working for Hope Worldwide. And uh, that was a, a big adventure, as you might imagine. And we started with a mobile clinic on the edge of town in a very large settlement area. And this is the first Christmas party that we had with the staff and, and their kids. As you can see, the, the dress code is fairly relaxed up there. We started with a clinic under the, under the tree. The government provided the, uh, the, the Toyota and the, and the van. And we just started seeing people in the caravan and on a desk under the, under the, in the shade of the trees. And then a couple of years later, the government built us uh, a shelter. And then after that, a fixed clinic. And we were also involved with, a, 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 there was a number of other projects happening at the same time. I was also involved teaching at the hospital and running a clinic. And one of the one of the issues that came up there was renal tubular acidosis, which was a little bit common there. And one of the things that is is treatable, which is nice. And and this is a girl who who's got um, uh, bone deformities, and then a, a younger boy who's got the the classic uh, rickets uh, features in his rib cage and wrists. Uh, we did research as well in yours, which is a spirochetal disease, which, which causes uh, ulcers on, uh, in the skin and also bone deformities. Uh, this is a survey we did and we, we wrote this up. And one of the great things, well, the only great thing about yours is it responds very quickly to a single dose of penicillin. And then three years later, we were sort of almost parachuted into Cambodia. There was a hospital that, that uh, needed to be opened but it didn't have any staff or didn't have any equipment. It wasn't even finished, as you can see, when we arrived and the Queen was coming to open it um, in about 12 weeks after we, we, we landed. Uh, we did get to meet the King and have lunch with the King and Queen. It was all very exciting, but, but somewhat stressful, but it all happened. And we got the hospital opened and that hospital is, that's the Seanock Hospital Centre of Hope. And that hospital is still thriving with a wonderful staff, um, nearly all Cambodians now. And uh, we spent 15 months there. It was an exciting time because there was a coup in the middle of that time. And uh, Helen and I were out, out of the country with our youngest and the two girls were in the country, but they got evacuated as honorary Filipinos by the Thai military. And so it, it, all, it all fell into place, but it was a stressful time. Then we went back to Papua New Guinea. We were involved with education programs and agriculture programs as well. And by the time we left Papua New Guinea, uh, this isn't quite how we dress, but this is a, uh, the family, three kids by now, uh, at, at, the, at, at, the, at the farewell party. And then when we got back to Sydney, it was early 2000, and Professor Martin Schilling, who was one of my mentors uh, when I was training, had, was with the International Diabetes Federation, and he'd been asked to set up a program to help young people with diabetes in less resourced countries. And so he asked me to help set up the program because I'd worked in Papua New Guinea and I'd had experience with, with sponsorship programs. And so we started. And of course, it's a much longer story than that. And, and you've heard, and I'm sure you all know, and, and you should be justly proud that Banting Best, uh, McLeod and Collop uh, isolated and then started to use insulin in Toronto in 1921, first used in 1922. And that's Marjorie the dog who features uh, heavily in in the story as well. And this, this shows what, what, a, what a wonder drug, and you may have seen these pictures before, but this is one of the first children treated with insulin and shows what a wonder drug insulin was. Uh, my favorite story from that time is, is this boy, Teddy Ryder, who is dressed up uh, in an outfit, but you can see his, his cadaverous in his appearance, uh, alive only on a starvation diet. A couple of years later, um, he was he was he was he was fit and and fine. This is the letter he wrote to Dr. Banting. Dear Dr. Banting, I wish you could come and see me. I'm a fat boy now and feel fine. I can climb a tree. Margaret would like to see you. Lots of love from Teddy Ryder. And the amazing thing is that Teddy lived until he was 75. He must have wonderful genes because you can imagine all the 
changes of treatment that he went through and he had none of none of the, there was no blood glucose monitoring no urine glucose monitoring at home then there was nothing and yet uh, he made it all the way through what a wonderful story and so insulin is universally recognized as an essential medicine and yet a hundred years later we still see this this is a picture taken a, a few a couple of years ago in india a young boy who was who was just staying alive and then, then a few weeks later, after he after starting on insulin, and I wanted to, sh uh, I'll, I'll just let you read this. And I, I should have actually put this in French and English, but I because uh, it was written in French. It, it's a devastating disease. It's a challenging disease, challenging disease everywhere. It's a devastating disease in these countries. This is a young fellow I saw in a, in a, on, on one of my visits and he was in his early twenties and he already had Charcot's arthropathy and all diabetes complications. And I, I, I just, I was struck. I, I was struck dumb. I, I didn't know what to say to him when I saw him because you realize the implications of the of the of the pathology that he that the complications that he had already. This is a picture I took in, in Khartoum in, in Sudan. And this 15-year-old boy had enough insulin to survive, but that was it. And he had Moriac syndrome. And this is the first time he'd been able to come to Khartoum to see the, the uh, Dr. Mohammed Abdullah. And a couple of days later, he was all smiles marching at the head of a, uh, a, a whole bunch of children who were marching along one of the main streets in Khartoum for World Diabetes Day. It was just fantastic to see the change in him. This is another quote from India uh, of a young, young fellow, which I still, if I read this aloud, I still struggle to read it. And, and why is this so? Well, well, it's, it, it's an expensive condition to manage. And we did a survey of 71 countries, uh, 19 low income countries, 18 lower middle income countries, 14 upper middle income countries and 20 high income countries. And we asked, could the government provide insulin for children less than 15 years? And you can see none of the low income countries and only two of the upper middle, uh, lower middle income countries couldn't even some of the upper middle income countries and one high income country couldn't do that. And the situation for test strips was even worse. And for glucagon, we, we set the bar at 5%. Do 5% of the families have access to glucagon at home? And, and it was virtually, it was, it, it's completely, was completely unavailable in lower middle income countries even, and also upper middle income countries. And I won't go through this slide in, in depth, but, but every aspect of care that we looked at, whether there were home refrigerators, whether there were syringes, whether there are pediatric endocrinologists, virtually all of these are different when you compare uh, Africa and Europe, for instance. And so the Life for a Child program commenced in 2000, aiming to, to, to try and address this need with the vision that no child should die of diabetes. And I think the key thing is that we work through existing diabetes centers. We, you won't go somewhere and find a life for a child center. You will find a national diabetes center or a diabetes association that's supported by life for a child. Uh, they, they do their own thing. We don't tell them what to do. We just support them according to their needs and according to our capacity. And we also conduct clinical research and international advocacy and where possible work towards a sustainability. The kind of support that we, uh, provide depends on the needs and what we can do, but we send insulin to, to um, 30, about 35 countries, meters and strips to more countries than that, syringes to many countries, support with HbO1c testing, help with complication screening, help with education, uh, both the patients and the staff. We help with camps on occasion, help with transport costs and communication, capacity building, technical advice and et cetera, and research. And, uh, the program's expanding quickly this year. We're now helping over 26,000 young people in 47 countries. You can see there's a number of usual suspects here and also some more unusual suspects like North Korea and, and Eritrea, uh, Tajikistan. Um, some of these countries have very interesting stories, as you might imagine. 
This is the amazing team that I have, uh, uh, mostly in Sydney, but one in one in the UK and, and one in uh, Bulgaria now. So Harry Kramer in, in fundraising, Annabelle Ong in logistics and finance, Janthi Manniams, our research officer, Rachel Clayton is in marketing, Cecile Eigerman's our diabetes educator, Emma Clayton does uh, policy and advocacy, and Sumathira Thabapalan has just joined us as our chief operating officer. And then we have an international steering committee. I won't go through everyone in detail, but, but many of you in pediatric endocrinology will know Ragnar Hannes, Stefan Bassanson works in Mali, uh, Mark Bryan's from Brazil, and Julia von Oettingen uh, lives in Canada. Uh, Julia is, works at McGill Hospital and has done lots of work in Liberia and in Haiti. We, ha we have many partners and donors. Uh, the, the big financial donors at Diabetes New South Wales, where I work, the Helmsley Charitable Trust in New York, JDRF in New York, and Diabetes Australia. We get a lot of in-kind support from pharma without any strings attached. Um, they don't tell us how to use the medicines or where to use them. Uh, but they, they help a lot. Uh, we work closely with, with ISPAD, the, the professional association uh, and, and other groups and many fantastic ind individual donors as well. We work with many NGOs, as you might imagine, and the Luxembourg Association, the Italian Diabetes Association, uh, uh, many others, the Swedes and, and, and others. And we have many research and advocacy partners, various, various universities, including uh, CHEO. And uh, we, we thank CHEO for their support over the years. And we look forward to, to further partnership. Also, you see McGill University on this list as well. So it opens the question, how do you manage a costly complex disease in a res resource poor country? And it isn't just about insulin. There's lots of talk about insulin. And obviously insulin is key. Without insulin, these young people would die, but there's a lot more to care than insulin. And we, we see it as, as four big areas. There's insulin, but there's also blood glucose monitoring, there's skilled medical care, and there's diabetes education of the family. And without any one of the four of these, you can potentially die quite quickly with type one. And these kids do. You need to have all of these. It isn't just insulin. And this is a good example of that. This boy is seeing a child specialist, and yet he's getting mixed insulin twice a day, getting his blood glucose checked once a month, and he was going to the hospital to have his injections all the time. And you can imagine the cost of the family. And then he found, then his parents found a, a center that was completely different to this and looked after him properly. But this is the sort of care that, that can happen in, in different places. So our paradigm of care, which we, we published a couple of years ago, is, is we, we talk about three levels of care. And they're on this slide, and I'll go into each of these in a little bit more depth, but there's minimal care with pretty bad outcomes. There's comprehensive care, which is what you, what you have in Canada, what we have in Australia, where, um, and then there's intermediate care. And it's intermediate care that we, we encourage centers to do because it's it's cost effective and in a in a less resource situation so comprehensive care is where you have access to analog insulin you have access to as many blood glucose strips as you need or, or preferably continuous glucose monitors or maybe even the, the artificial pancreas with closed loop you have all the complications screening and lots of diabetes education and you can get very very good outcomes uh, with that mean A1Cs, uh, preferably sort of 6.5 to 7.5, um, and the mortality and complications are very rare. But lots of these countries, it's just minimal care, where the children are getting enough insulin to survive, but that's about it, as some of these stories that I've, 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 I've mentioned, and the A1Cs are very high. So we, we proposed intermediate care, which is human insulin or analog insulin if, if it's available with two to four blood glucose tests a day. HbA1c is very important and, and diabetes education is critical. And we've shown and others have shown that you can achieve rates that, that, that HbA1c levels that, that rarely cause serious long-term complications if you do this. And we've modeled this uh, in, in, a, 
in a, in a math mathematical modeling study in six countries where we looked at, the, at, at, at these six countries. We, we compared an A1C of 12.5 versus eight and a half or nine, depending on the country. And working with the University of Pittsburgh, we looked at 30 year complications rates and modeled all that through. And this is a slide that shows what I was talking about about, that, about A1C. Now, the, what, the target range is less than seven or less than 7.5 and less resource countries. But even if you can get your A1C down to nine or 8.5, let's look at just blindness and renal failure, these two very serious complications. You can see that you can virtually eliminate those even at that level, although it's better to go further down for, 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 for obvious reasons. And we, we ran through, worked through all the costs and worked out the costs over 30 years and also the DALIs, the disability adjusted life years, the health and, and the inverse, the healthy life years. And not surprisingly, the, the predicted survival rates over 30 years were much better in, uh, uh, with intermediate care. And the cost of intermediate care, it was cost effective according to the, the, how the WHO defined this. And, and all these, all these um, percentages are with, within a, 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 an, an appropriate um, uh, cost effective band according to the WHO. Example of a country where we help is Mali, where it, there was a publication in 1999 with some follow-up data that 18 of 20 children with T1D died within three years. But now there's over 600 young people there and we've worked through the Santa Diabet and the Malian Ministry of Health. And we published this last year, the, 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 the experience from Mali. And you can see that, the, that each year the diagnoses have gone up. Now we know that incidence is rising in some countries, but this is far beyond that. And it took us a little while to work out what we think, what, what is happening. But what is happening is that children are, were dying undiagnosed. They were, they were dying in DKA and they were being diagnosed as malaria or meningitis or HIV or ectopic pregnancy, or there's a whole terrible litany of, of misdiagnoses. And that, that's represented in the story from this boy from Ghana where he talks about for five months, the diagnosis wasn't made. And he was wetting his bed and, and he, was, he was being you know, laughed at and all that sort of thing. And then he went to DKA and like, fortunately for him, or the diagnosis was, was or fortunately the diagnosis was made then, otherwise he would have died. Sorry, I've just got a problem here with, here we go, advancing the slides. And what, what we did here was we did a poster campaign about this. And this is the poster that went out in French and Bambara about the signs of ketoacidosis. And we think the very, the very distribution of this poster to health centers markedly improved the complications rate, uh, the, the, the pickup rate of, of di diagnosis. So not surprising, the prevalence is increasing very quickly. So what's most important, I think local champions are most important, dedicated, skilled, organized and connected local champions. And what's needed, insulin is needed. Do you need analogs or pumps? Well, if, if, if you can afford them, but analogs, insulin is three to five times more expensive than human insulin. Um, it, the analogs don't, haven't been shown to improve A1C despite what you might think. It, they haven't been shown to do that. They do reduce severe nocturnal hypoglycemia in children with T1D in well-resourced countries and probably do in less resourced countries. We don't know yet. They do need, you do need to have cartridges and pens because that's the, generally the form that they come in and, and that's more expensive as well. But we, for the, this year, for the first time, we have access to some analog insulin. And so now we're, be, we're going to be studying the effect, the impact of it in different countries. But what is important is a basal bolus or a multiple daily uh, in injections. And more important to spend money on is blood glucose monitoring and A1C so that you know where you're going. And the paradox is that that's more expensive than insulin. So the red bars here are the cost in different countries of two tests per day. And the blue bars were the cost to the family for insulin. 
And you can see that insulin was cheaper than two blood just two blood glucose tests a day. So we did some work looking at the global market on this and, and understanding that, which, which was novel. And uh, we looked at the, the prices that the, the, the countries were paying for strips. And you can see that New Zealand were getting their strips for 17 cents each, while in America was paying 87 cents each. These are US cents. And some other countries were cheaper. And that showed us that these, these things aren't that expensive to make. There's just markups. And, and to work, and we're working with companies with a group called Find in, 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 in Switzerland, aiming to reduce the price and uh, uh, the access price. Also, we found that import duties were higher for strips than insulin, which doesn't help. And so that needs advocacy, advocacy to reduce the, the import duties. And so we talked about insulin, we talked about blood, blood glucose monitoring. The other two parts of it are diabetes education for the children and the families, and also for health professionals. And I think this quote describes it well. This boy spent months in hospital until someone realized that, oh, the family can give the injections at home. Oh, maybe we can teach this boy to give the injections at home. And as soon as the penny dropped about that, he went home. And Ray, going back to the, uh, Ray from, from Ghana, he talks about how he, he, he was um, getting sick and then went to the hospital um, in, in hyperglycemia and he had a glucose and saline infusion and got sicker. And then that was the turning point for him. He was about 12 or 13 at this time and he started to get educated and he was so sick of going to hospitals and seeing nurses and doctors that he, um, he started, started to get his act together. He was given a meter to check his glucose. He started to understand he was educated. And then he said that was the first month that I didn't get sick, I was happy. My life and my families began to turn around. And we've produced a, a number of education materials. We realized that the, the pocketbook guidelines uh, that the, the ISPAD guidelines are excellent, but they're, but they're long and they're complicated. And if you're a doctor or a, a health worker in a less resourced country, you're not experienced in type one diabetes and you have a child dying in front of you at DKA, you don't wanna know all the different options and all the different bits and everything. You, what do I do first? What do I do second? And so we, we scaled down the ISPAD guidelines to a, to a pocketbook size. And we have this in English and in French and in Azeri and Spanish um, as, as well. And uh, there was a wonderful comic book, graphic novel produced by uh, Marguerite de Klerk, who's a Belgian nun. She's now 93 and still going strong. Extraordinary lady. And she and her team produced this comic book about two young children in, in Democratic Republic of Congo who developed type one and, and how they learn and look after each other. And this has proved immensely popular around the world and it's been translated into various languages and more, more will follow. There's also in-country resources which we've helped promote um, the Kay Mackinson Book uh, Center in, in, in Haiti. This is another book from Bangladesh. They were resources, they're already existing. This is something that we've just released uh, on carbohydrate counting in India because we were told that there's, there's a need for this book and so uh, it, it's both in uh, PDF form and also hard copy. And it has the pictures from the competition. The first section is all about carb counting and what it is. The second section is about Indian foods. And, and the aim is that this can be replaced by Bolivian foods or Mexican foods, and it will be um, over the next year or so and, and other countries. And so various carb counting for the Indian foods, lots of different pages of these. And then there's an international food section and uh, with, with international foods that are common around the world. And then this is the picture at the end of the book. And I just love this picture. This is done by a young fellow who's, who's um, in, in Sri Lanka who's not surprisingly just started um, architecture um, at university because it's just a brilliant drawing uh, that he, 
that he sent in uh, for the art competition. We've had many site visitors go to many countries and uh, uh, not for the last two years, but, but before then, and it's just starting to resume now. And two of those site visitors, are Dr. Alex Ahmed and Dr. Caroline Zudrig from, from CHEO, and they went to the uh, Dream Trust in Nagpur. Um, uh, there were two visits. And in the middle is James Ron, who's a, a professor of international relations. And um, Jim's son, Sasha, was diagnosed at CHEO when he was very young. And, and Jim contacted me and wanted to help. And that led to, to, to Alex and Caroline getting involved and which was just fantastic. And that led to a, to a number of studies, uh, one on uh, the, the, the situation there at the clinic, another one on, on blood glucose monitoring at the clinic and, and the, the impact of that, but also the challenges of introducing that. And that led to a further round of studies, three, three I just put up one here, but three studies on caregiving and, and the stigma associated with diabetes. And, uh, the stigma was can be quite profound in India. Indeed, that's why that this this center was established because uh, people, children with diabetes, especially young ladies with diabetes, often were refused school. They had trouble finding employment, and they were refused marriage as well. And some some ladies, um, even in India, still have to hide the fact that they've got type one until after they're married. We've had um, various experts go to various countries. Uh, this is a group, uh, some experts from Holland and from the US in Nepal, and a group from Norway in Tajikistan doing a workshop there. Now, I think another thing I wanted to, to get across is the importance of data and the importance of monitoring and evaluation. And we were formally evaluated by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in 2015, and that report had three main messages. Firstly, that it was, it was a good program, it was effective. Secondly, that we needed to make more use of data collected and potentially available. And it was called a global public good and that which woke us up. And the second is we needed to do more with work with promoting self-sufficiency. So we followed these things through. And there's a concept of benchmarking. And these, this is the SWEET project, the International SWEET project. And these are mean A1Cs of various clinics around the world. And it isn't so much who's first, it's where you are and where you could be next year and how do you improve that's important with this. And we've taken this concept on board and we've looked at clinics that we support in, in, in Bolivia and in Mexico and compared them to the US data from the T1D exchange. And you can see that um, uh, these clinics in Mexico and Bolivia, despite having less resources, are doing, are doing pretty well. And we've looked at, um, we're looking at all our centers. And again, it, as I said, it isn't so much who's winning, it, it's where they are and how, and how, how do you improve that with, with the, the concept of benchmarking. And we've been involved in various other novel research studies. And I wanted to acknowledge, I've had some wonderful students, but, but Gabriel Gregory uh, and Danira, uh, who's done a lot of the modeling work, Danira Govinder, who's actually Canadian. Uh, she came to do a medical school in Sydney and she's now doing anesthetics training in Winnipeg and Boris Waldman. So Danira did a lot of the studies on the types of diabetes and Boris uh, had a, uh, spoke Russian. So we sent him to Uzbekistan and Tajikistan uh, for studies. And this is one of the studies that uh, we did looking at uh, with the London School, looking at universal health coverage. And I'll just skip through this quickly, but essentially what you want in a health system is you want everyone to be covered. You want to have lots of services and you don't want people, you want to be affordable, but you don't have enough money necessarily to do all that. Now, in a country like the UK or, or France, you, you do, and people with this, everyone gets insulin, they don't have to pay anything and they get all the insulin they need. And the same with test strips. But in Japan and Australia, you have to pay a little bit, but otherwise it's the same. In Guyana, you don't get analog insulin and you don't get that many test strips, but they are available. In Rwanda, 
there's insulin coverage, but not for everyone and you do have to pay something, but there's no test strip coverage at all. And then in Ecuador, there's less coverage with insulin, but some, again, no test strip coverage. And in Haiti, there's no coverage at all. And so these countries are at different stages. And as you can see, the situation is worse for strips than it is for insulin. And we've been doing a lot of advocacy about this and the WHO is now picking this up as well, which is exciting. Another study we did was we realized that, that um, young people often lived in homes without refrigerators and these countries can get very hot. So how do you store the insulin? Now, in many countries, they use clay pots, and this is a, a water-filled pot with a hessian bag, and the water is dripping down into another pot here, and the insulin is kept here. And I was there. I visited this boy on a family on a very hot day, and I put my finger in the water, and it was cooler there. So we actually did a study on this, and uh, we called it the Clay Pot Olympics. Michael Sorensen, another student, medical student uh, from, from Copenhagen, actually, went to Khartoum to do the study. We had pots from, from, from six different countries and we tested them. And this is the ambient temperature. And you can see that all devices did better than the ambient temperature, but some of them were much better. And so we analyzed this and the four best devices were two pots, um, two large pots, uh, the Frio bags that are made for this purpose using evaporative cooling and, and the goat skin. And the goat skin, actually, it was cluster analysis, so you couldn't separate the top four. But on the numbers, the goat skin was actually the winner, but maybe slightly impractical in some situations. But the large evaporative area, it, it, kept, things, it kept things cool. And I'm very pleased to report that that same center that Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Zujwik went and helped and did the research with has been the site for a, for a, a real world thermostability study that we're doing uh, that was done during peak COVID in, in, um, in, in India earlier this year. And the samples are now um, in Florida and then about to go to Sweden for analysis to find out, well, if, if you keep insulin out of the fridge for two months or four months at 30 odd degrees Celsius, does it really affect it that much? And uh, ask us in six months and, and we will know the answer to that. There's evidence that, that previous evidence that, that maybe it's not, it's more thermostable than we, than, than we think it is. We've also done a lot of work in incidents and I'll skip through this, but incidents varies widely around the world. You can see that that Canada um, here in the green bar has a very high incidence, although this is Nova Scotia incidence, it's, 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 it's lower in, in British Columbia. Uh, and it goes right down to lower levels, but lots of countries don't have data. Lots of countries have old data. So this is a study that Boris Waldman did with the Uzbeks. They had data which had to be put together with an incidence that's rising, a prevalence that's rising and a mortality that's falling, just, just what you want to see. We've done work in the Maldives, which has a very rapid rate of increase. Uh, in Eritrea, we published this last year. And what we found is in the 15 to 19 year olds, they have the highest incidence of type one diabetes known, even higher than, than in Scandinavia. And this is seen in, 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 in refugee families that come from Eritrea and Somalia as well to our countries. Not everything is type two in these countries. This is, a young, this is a young fellow in his early 20s who presented needing an amputation. So he, he doesn't, it doesn't have type one because it's too acute for, for that. So he, he must have some form of type two or, or some insulin deficient form of, of type two. And, and this, is, this is seen in Africa and in India, um, not usually so extreme. And teasing this out is important because maybe there's other options for treatment for these sorts of cases. So that's the work that De Niro, um, the, the Canadian student, has been involved with. And then also in, in we, we found in Bangladesh that the age of onset is later, which fits in with, with, with these, these hypotheses that there's different types of type 1 or maybe it isn't even quite type 1 that's happening. And then type 2 can occur in young people as well. And in Bangladesh, the incident doesn't appear to be rising. The, the type one numbers seem to be fairly stable. 
but there's more and more type two being recognized over time. And this has been the time of COVID and it's hit everywhere around the world. Uh, we've sent out supplies, but there's lots of, you can imagine the challenges of these countries. You know, the challenge you've, your country's had and, and Australia's had, but, but we're well resourced. You can imagine how it's hit these countries so hard. We've heard of young people with diabetes dying. Um, there's been a rush, a push to get them vaccinated, obviously. We've sent out a lot of funds. In, in, in the first instance, it was for food for families, just to get through the lockdowns. And then for transport for emergency insulin supplies, we had insulin, there were just places, we still have trouble getting flights into certain countries to get supplies in it. It's just, there's been so many impacts. And uh, so these emergency funds have been needed. And some wonderful stories, these two uh, young Sri Lankans with, with type one diabetes went all over the country delivering supplies with police permission. This is a doctor's son in India who went through a number of police checkpoints to this final checkpoint so that he could hand over some supplies to the young fellow on the, on the left-hand side with diabetes. And sort of heading towards the end, our vision is to support more young people in more countries with working towards 150,000 people by 2030. And we estimate that there is around 300,000 young people in need. So if we can get to anywhere close to 150,000, we're making a big dent in the problem. And we want to do more with improving outcomes. And we want to encourage, continue to encourage local provision of type one diabetes care. And we, we've estimated that, that um, if, if you can provide intermediate, even intermediate care, you could save 8,000 lives a year. And we're now doing some work with JDRF uh, honing in on these, uh, drilling down on these numbers to, to make them more accurate and to understand more about the global burden of type one and what the numbers that, that they're potentially dying are. So that's that project. And finally, just uh, a, a couple of stories. This fellow uh, was called, is called Brandon. He's in Bolivia. He was five years old when he was diagnosed and he remembers the doctors cutting his fingers with razor blades because there were no lancets in the hospital to do uh, to, to, to get uh, to cut to, to do the finger pricks. And I met him when he was about 13. There he is with his mum. Uh, he's now he's now a dentist. Um, it just and this is what he said. There are other dentists who don't want to treat them because diabetes makes it harder. But I, as a person with diabetes, understand what it's like and want to help them. And there he is with his very proud mum. Another young lady uh, in, in, in Bangladesh named Sadia, who is now um, helping as a volunteer in the, in the um, association and also studying law. And finally, Ray, the story, we, we, this is what he wrote at the end of his story. He said, for nine years, I've been diabetic. For two years, I was alive without quality, but for the last seven years, it's been great. No admission in seven years is quite an achievement. I still have my whole life ahead of me. I am a high school graduate about to enter the university. I'm looking towards a great future with good health. And this is what we want for all young people uh, to grow up and live their lives and, and, and to thrive. So, so thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Ogle. That was a truly inspirational presentation. Uh, I, I'm just thinking about all the things that you, you talked about and in such a humble way, uh, really fantastic achievements. And, uh, and again, I think it's, it's really about that inspira inspiration and showing us the way. I think really also showing the strength of international collaboration around a cause to make a real difference in health outcomes for children and their families. Um, we, um, we have a number of uh, participants and I'm gonna open this up to, um, you, you've given us lots of time for questions and, and comments, so thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna open this up. Um, we'll monitor the chat um, as well as um, if, if you want to just um, start 
asking your question, you can raise your blue hand and we'll, uh, we'll look out for you. Sorry, can, how can we raise our hand? Oh, sorry, okay, go ahead, um, Hadi. Okay, hi, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ogil. It was a fantastic talk. I, I work mainly in places like Malawi, Liberia, Mozambique, and, uh, and uh, you know, I think nobody knows, who knows your guess is as good as mine, what's the real incidence of diabetes there, because most yeah. of these children, as you said, die without diagnosis, and, and they're lucky, so to speak, if they get DKA and come to a hospital to get diagnosed. The problem that we have, though, is, is as you said again, rightly, is not just insulin, because, uh, you know, as an example, I was there a while ago, and we sent a kid who was on, for example, six units of insulin in the morning, two of uh, regular, four of NPH, and that was 0.02 cc of each. And there was no mother. A lot of times these children are looked after by a big number of people. You know, the, the whole village sometimes looks after a child. Uh, but this kid's particular child, mother was, 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 was missing, probably HIV positive. And, uh, and, and most women are illiterate. Uh, so imagine teaching, if we, we found some insulin and they would keep it in a clay jar, uh, but uh, uh, um, the grandfather would come with the child or sometimes with the uncle would come, sometimes somebody else. So we, we couldn't, it is almost impossible to educate you know, at the hospital. There has to be education at the village level, which doesn't exist. And, and second thing was that we send them with insulin. Sometimes they find the 30 line syringe. Sometimes they find the 50 line syringe. Sometimes they find the hundreds. So we stop treating the kid because they would come. They would always give the wrong dose because you know the child goes to the local. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are no doctors in a place like Malawi or, or Muslim. They're mainly physician assistant, clinical officers, which you know they do 99% of the healthcare of the country. Uh, but, but, so there was a big. After a while, we decided because we caused more problem by you know, giving insulin and the government would not supply syringes or, you know, or, you know, there's no testing, as you said, testing doesn't exist. But even if you give them insulin and you tell them, draw up this, you know, one, a small line of this hundred, you know, divided syringe, after a few days, they run out of the syringes, they go to their grocery store or somewhere, they give them 30 line syringes or they go to some. So that was, you know, technological problem is one big problem, but cultural, you know, economical, societal, most women being illiterate, children being looked after, a large number of people, and who knows what the incidence and mortality of I it is a lot worse than HIV to have diabetes for a child in there. Yes, I, I think it is. And yet on the other hand, I think there are, you know, we work in Liberia and there's the numbers are growing there. We, we, we help four centers um and other partners in health is also helping there and in Malawi and 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 Mozambique, and there's plans afoot in, in all of those countries. And I think once you start with a center that, that builds a, a cohort, then, then it is, it is self-fulfilling in many ways. And yes, you still have problems, many problems, and uh, particularly with, with, with extreme poverty. And, and these young people start supporting each other and, and technology is helping. And often there is some access to mobile phones and they have WhatsApp groups. I've been, I remember going to Tanzania and the, the young leaders were, were texting and, and they explained to me, oh, there's a young patient, you know, just newly diagnosed and they were looking after him. And so I, I think it, it does come down to local champions and to supporting local centers and you have to start somewhere. And it, 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 it is, it, it, you know, there are lots of successes and, and lots, of, lots of disappointments, but it really is changing in these countries. And I, Mali is a very poor country, and yet we've gone from 14 to 600 and the numbers keep on going up. And that's, that's, due, that's due to the local partner there and, and the uh, Santa Diabet and, and the Ministry of Health and, and the young people with diabetes themselves. So it is possible to change the situation, but it is, it is hard work and it, it does uh, take time. Yeah, as you thank said. you. I'm going to move on because we have oh. a few other questions, Hattie. Um, okay. Thank you. There are many expressions of uh, of wow and awesome in uh, in the chat, so uh, it would be good to uh, collect those and send them on to you, uh, Graham. There are a few questions that are in the chat. I'm just going to read them to you. Um, the first is, um, this is coming from an adult physician, uh, a global health champion as well. Is there a plan for transition and ongoing care for these children 
who should have expanded life expectancy. And you've def definitely illustrated that. Um, we want to see full benefit of all this great work. So can you speak to the transition to adult? Care? Yeah, that's a good question. We, we support people up to the age of 25 for that very purpose, that very reason that, that we try and get them through so that they can be, they can be uh, hopefully be independent and have had an education. We, we then don't have a full answer after that, but, but a partner organisation, Inchin for Life, provides supplies. They, they collect unused supplies and, and send, those, send those over. We also work with some countries have, have microcredit or education programs and things like that. We don't have a we don't have a full answer to after twenty five, but but the issue of transition is a problem in some countries, particularly if the hospitals themselves. Some of these pediatric units finish at the age of twelve, and the child goes to the adult centre, which is which is very difficult. So we try not just to work with the pediatric centres; we try to work with the adult centres as well. And, and we have that age bracket up to 25, but we don't have all the answers yet. But again, we're, we're, we're making progress on that one. But transition is an issue, as you, as you know, all over the world, particularly for diabetes, but also some other conditions. Yeah, great. I imagine you are, are creating a number of ambassadors that are going into, uh, into the adult world um, that can help with that cause as well. Exactly. Um, but, some of them yeah. are very vocal and, and militant, yeah. which is great. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, the, uh, the next question comes from our program director, another uh, global health champion, uh, Toby Odsent. Uh, I see you have many, you've involved many learners in advocacy through scholarship. Uh, any reflections for our students and residents in this regard? Uh, sorry, just, I'm just trying to understand the... To Toby, do you want to speak to your question? Apologies, my question's probably not specific enough, but um, congratulations on the amazing talk. But um, I was noticing a strong theme of um, students and um, other learners who've been working with you. Um, uh, so as a mentor, any reflections um, of what you've learned over the years to try and help our learners who are just getting started and may want to engage in um, their own advocacy through scholarship? Yeah, I, I think on the on the research front, we if people want to do research and they 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 can travel or something like that, we're always open to even if they can't travel. But then it helps if they're in, in Sydney. We've as a we've we've had some wonderful students come through, and I think with with advocacy with young people with advocacy, we are about to start a scholarship program, small small grants program for advocates with T1D. And I, and I think it, it's it's just mentoring. I was mentored by Martin Schilling, who was just Martin. Well, Martin is amazing. He continues to to uh, continue to ask him advice, even though he's 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 retired some time ago. And and hopefully the students that that, that we have come well, they are that they, they do the same. And that's the process of medicine, isn't it? To to keep on teaching. You learn from people, and then you teach, and and then it goes on. And there are lots of opportunities there um, and people just have to ask and, and explore. And, you know, it started for me going to Papua New Guinea as a medical student, as, as, as I said, and it all sort of unfolded from there in completely unexpected ways because you never know what's going to happen, but it, but it did happen. And, and so I just encourage people to have a go and to get advice. I'm going to ask you the last question. Uh, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask the question myself. Um, you, you presented this incredible international effort um, uh, and with, with really some amazing successes. Um, and then you kind of glossed over, you know, COVID happened and we kept going. And I'm wondering, uh, I, 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 um, I, I'm wondering if you could speak to, maybe even in briefly, um, speak to what you think you had in terms of, um, in terms of your uh, your group, in terms of what you had as an organization that helped you to get through um, and to continue your efforts through through COVID, where you know around the world everyone was struggling, um, what do you think you had that helped you through that? Yeah, I think there's two answers there. I think good relationships with the people on the ground, and we did all everything we could to encourage them. And we had donors who were prepared to help. We had money from the Helmsley Trust, money from JDRF, money from, from individual donors. 
um, that we put towards this. And we just wrote to them and said, what do you need? And they didn't ask for you know $159,000. They asked for, for $7,000 to do this or $3,000 to do that or something like that. And it was different in different places. It was food in some places. It was transport. It was keeping... A lot, of, a lot of the business models of these centres that, that make money from rich patients and help poorer patients, they collapsed because the rich patients weren't coming. And so there was, we, we supported staff and things. And I think, I think it's good relations, trusted relationships with these centres and then just wonderful people in these centres. And, and, and they do. And of course, we've lost a lot of ground. You know, care has gone backwards, you know, appointments and difficulties. But, but people, have, people have done their best and they're banded together like they have everywhere, but it but it is a it is a big collaboration across across the globe and within their countries. Well, thank you for all that you have been doing uh, and continue to do. Thank you for sharing that experience with us and really inspiring us to continue to do what's so important to all of us. Uh, so My thank pleasure. you. Uh, have a good night's sleep. Yep. Um, 